Great, thank you, Tanya. Um, I did ask uh, Tanya to let me know as the questions come up. So as I'm going along, if you guys want to throw something in, I'd like to answer it as I'm going through the process so I don't get questions at the end that don't really relate to what's happening when I'm doing the drawing. I'm planning on doing this drawing uh, live in front of you. I do have some backup images in case I really screw up and, and go off track, but hopefully I'll, I'll get to show you how this works as we're going. And just a quick clarification, I'm not a, a full-time forensic artist, I'm a freelance forensic artist, so basically I work for myself and work for other agencies who call on me to do uh, either reconstructions from skeletal remains or composites, which is a drawing uh, with a witness of a crime to draw a suspect of a crime. But anyway, what I have in front of you here is a, a case. This is actually a skull that I've kind of um, cleaned up so it's not immediately recognizable as a specific victim, but I have permission from a medical examiner's office that I work with on, on this specific case to use this skull. But this is a skull that I was given on a case of unidentified remains, and I was told this was a white male in his uh, mid-30s and he's unidentified, they just have the, the remains and they're trying to find out who he is. So this is what I'm given. I go down to the medical examiner's office and take a look at the skull and try and find out what there is about this skull that makes it different from every other skull. Now, if you don't work with uh, human remains very often, you're not familiar with the differences between skulls. And I'll show you really quickly, I made a really quick image of uh, skulls in particular. Now these are training skulls and it's the quality of training skulls is not necessarily what one might want um, compared to the quality of, of human skulls, but th this is what I have to work with, so this is what I'm going to show you. What I have from left to right is an African-derived skull, a European-derived skull, and an Asian-derived skull. Those are the three main skull types and those can be broken down into several different varieties. I mean, you have all the different uh, areas of Africa from Egypt in the north and down through Rwanda, Rwanda and uh, down to uh, South Africa. All, all the different skull types within there are different looking as well, but this is your basic general African skull type. European skull types you can have from Nordic down to Italian, you know, you can have uh, South American also can fall into this. And then under the Asian skull types, a Chinese person is going to look different from a Japanese person, looks different from a Thai person, and so on. But then you also have the intermixing of the races. And so eventually, maybe we'll all just be homogenous and we'll all look the same. But in this case, we start out right now with these three basic skull types. And you can see from the profiles that they do look different as well. So the way that I describe it is that the African skull from the profile, you see that it's kind of longer than it is tall. Um, generally, an African skull is more prognathic than the other two skulls. This one is not necessarily as much as the others. And I'll show you a photo. I did bring some, uh, some class source photos that I had set aside. Uh, to try and illustrate this a little bit better. But here's a photo. This is what I'm talking about with prognathic, a photo I got off the internet. Notice how the front part of the lower part of his face uh, pulls forward. So that's more generally seen in an African-derived skull. So the, uh, the mouth portion comes forward some more. You'll see also from the, um, the front, the anterior view, that the nasal opening is wider. The shape of the orbital cavities is different, the, the eyes is different than it is with the other two different skulls. Uh, there's some differences in the nasal sill, the bottom section of the nose, uh, the bottom line of the nasal opening is different. So those are some general ideas. There's also on many African-derived skulls, there's a, a post-pragmatic depression. There's a, a little sort of depression right up here on the top of the skull that you'll see in an African-derived skull. This guy doesn't have it. Coming over to the European derived skull, I think of these as kind of between the other two. It's not, it's not longer and it's not taller. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. But you'll see that this, um, these are all male skulls. You'll see that this guy has a much higher um, bone right here at the top of the, the nasal bone is higher. You see it's not as high in the Asian and the African. In the Asian skull, the um, the top of the nasal bone here is often so low that you can almost see both eyes 
uh, from a profile view, but in the European, the top of the nasal bone is highest between the other two different skulls. It's the highest one. Um, I think of the European skull as leading with the nose. The nose sticks out further forward. In the African skull, it's usually the mouth. In the European, it's usually the nose. And in the Asian, I think of it as more like the whole face comes forward uh, at the same time. Um, with the uh, European skull, the nose is usually more of a teardrop shape, a longer and thinner shape. And the eye orbital cavity is sort of a, a, a rectangle that kind of leans out a little bit. Um, and the bottom of the nasal sill is not the same. Well, okay, the African nasal sill is what is called guttered. The European nasal sill is more of a sharp edge, and the Asian nasal sill has a, a dull edge to it. With the Asian skull, it's taller top to bottom than it is front to back, and as I said, the, the front of the face is usually flatter. And I'll show you a profile that I was talking about with the, with the Asian head. Oh, this guy's a little bringing big. You notice how from the side, you can almost see the other eye there. The, uh, this section between, between the two eyes is very low on the nose there. So there are specific differences between the skulls. And when the medical examiner tells me this is a white male, I know that those differences are going to show up on this skull. So I'm working on this guy as a white male. And so what I come through with to start with, I put a, a film over the, the image that I'm working with so that I can see when I draw a line, I can see it on the skull. If I'm drawing a line, for instance, on black, I can see it. If I didn't have that film on it, you notice I can't see that line on there. So I like to keep a film on there so I can see when I've, hit, when I've got something drawn on there. So I start with that, and then I also have a second layer of white. And notice I, this is basically a, um, a white layer that I've dumped down to 20%. I have a second layer of white that I have at 100% opacity that I can just turn on and off so I can see my drawing as I progress with it. I have brought in the two photographs that I took at the medical examiner's office, and I've sized them so the two rulers are the exact same size. So both of these images, the profile and the anterior, are the same size images. Now you see these have what's called tissue depth markers all over them. When I go into the medical examiner's office and I'm told this is a white male, I have a chart that tells me how deep the tissue is from the bone to the surface of the skin for a white male of average size. Uh, Dr. Stanley Ryan was a, a doctor in the, I believe, the 60s in the U.S. who did measurements of several cadavers and came up with these charts of uh, different races and average, thin, and heavy build people, how deep the tissue is in 21 different locations all over the face. And so that is what forensic artists use to do the measurements. So I have put these tissue death markers, glued them onto the skull, and then photographed the skull and brought that home and brought it into my painter program and set it up. So now I have both skulls, the profile and the anterior. Now I'm not going to do the profile drawing for you today because it would take too long, but I do have that uh, already drawn in here so you can see it. After I've done that, I come through and uh, copy and paste the ruler from one of them so that I can use that when I'm doing the measurements. So that's what I'm going to come up with and start with. So I'm going to start, I already have these things done, but I'm going to show you how I do it. So I'm going to start uh, from there with a new layer which I'm going to call measure. I'm going to do it in red. This is to give me some idea of what the measurements are, where I, where I begin the drawing, and let me keep to those measurements as I work through. So I'm going to bring my ruler up and start with the eyes. That's how I usually like to begin. Now, the eyes normally orbital cavities will have what is called a malar tubercle. It's a little tiny indication on the outside of the eyes that tell me where the eyelid attaches. And I'll show you one skull that I work with that does have this. This is a case that I had earlier, a couple years ago. It shows a malar tubercle. You can see on here, and it's, it's Unfortunately, it's a little bit difficult to see, but it's a lot easier to feel, and you can probably feel it on your own eyes, but you can see this bone has a little bit of a dip on it, and you can see it on here. Can you see that? It kind of dips in there. 
and that's where the eyelid actually pulls the bone and attaches the eyelid to the outside of the bone. It's making a, it's pulling the bone out from the edge. And so that's gonna tell me where the eyelid attaches on this guy. This guy, you can't see it very well. I can see that it's in here, but it's really hard to tell. So I'm gonna have to measure it on this fella instead of bringing it in. But if you do not see that on the, uh, on the photograph, you can draw it in with the ruler. So I can bring my ruler up here and measure in uh, where I'm gonna put the eyeballs on this skull. So to do that, I'll start with his right eye, which is on the left side of the screen. So I'll bring the ruler up to where the orbital cavity is and draw the center of that. So it'll come from here and it's 10, 20, 30. It's about 40, maybe 43. And so half of that is 20 and a little bit will be about half. That's about the center going in that direction. And come over to the other eye. And that's the lacrimal fossa there. So I'll start here and measure 10, 20, 30, 40. And so come back to this pencil and 10, 20 is about the center there. Okay, then I'll come to my ruler and uh, rotate it 90 degrees and do it again from the top to bottom. And I'll do it from the center of the orbital cavity, which is about where this tissue depth marker is. So at about there, from top to bottom, it's 10, 20, 30, 35. And so that would be 15, about 17 is about here. So that would be the center of the orbital cavity would be somewhere around there for this guy. And then let's come over to the other eye. Oh, there we go. Come over to this eye. At about there, 10, 20, 35. Click back up on the correct layer. And so that's 15 and a half is about there. Okay, so if I zoom out and get rid of the ruler, that looks a little high and outside to me. Let me confirm I have that right. That one looks pretty good, but let me confirm that that one's in the right spot. By turning the ruler back on, and rotating it again. Oh, that's the wrong layer. I was clicked on the wrong layer again. Sometimes you gotta make sure it gets it to a, the right layer before you do that. Okay, let me check in one more time. Zoom in and start it here. Yeah, I think it went 45. I think it went a little too far. So I'm gonna bring him in a bit. From here, 10, 20, I'd say maybe it's closer to there. And erase that mark. Dump that down. That's a little better. Okay, so that's about the center of the orbital cavities for the eyes. Now I have to make the eyeballs. Now an eyeball, is 25 millimeters around. That's about the size of a US quarter. So Painter has the circle tool and that's what I'm gonna to use to make that. If you hold down the shift key while you're making a circle, it'll make it a exact circle. So there's 20 on my ruler and there's 25 right there. And I'll go to the shape attributes, tell it I want a stroke and let's make the center in white. And there's my circle, 25 millimeters. So let's move it over to where it needs to be here. If I put it under the measure layer, that'll show me where the center is. I'll come down here under my uh, command palettes. I have a command for show guides. Oh, look, there it is. I've already made a guide for the center line there. Let me dump that I one out. I have a question for you, Natalie. Yeah. 
Are all eyes 25 millimeters? Yes, they are. All mm -hmm. eyes, even for babies. And that's why babies look like they have really big eyes. Oh, interesting. Their eyes are the right size already. Their heads just haven't grown into them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and so. I know that you do almost all of your work remote, but yes. you did have a question. Somebody asked, do you ever take photos yourself or are you always receiving those from the agent? I do these. Yeah, I go up and photograph these myself. I work a lot with the medical examiner's office in Seattle. And uh, I do still have family in Seattle, so when I take trips up there, I will go and uh, and do the cases that they have waiting for me there. Or occasionally, if they can't wait, they will mail the skulls to me down here, and I will work on them here and then mail them back. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> People mail skulls. It happens. Okay. So luckily, when I'm, when I'm working on this little shape here, um, notice I'm selected on the, it says oval, but it's a circle. Uh, Painter has these little um, marks on the corners for me that shows me when I am centered. And since I have centered on this mark that I have made, it shows me the little squares there that I'm exactly centered on where I want to be there. On my command palette, I have a duplicate layer command. And so I can duplicate that circle and bring it over here. And now this eye, as you see, is a little bit lower than the other one. And let me move that over there. And that's about right. So if I move him over there a little bit, there he is. Okay, so there's that eyeball. Now I need the, the iris in the center. So let's come over and make another one. And that would be half of that size. It's about 12 and a half. So hold that down again and make it about that big. Now bring the iris back to this guy. That's almost in place. Nudge it back into place there. And I'll duplicate that again and bring it over to this side. Actually, that's not a bad size. Where is he? Um, he's the lower side. There he is. Okay. All right, once I've done that, I'm going to select both of those. Notice that they're both centered on that and collapse that eye. Commit that layer and this is going to be left eye. And then do the same with this one so that I have right eye. So those dudes are done. Turn that off. I have right. another question from yep. Arvin. He's yep. wondering, um, how did you scan the rulers and scale? When I'm photographing the skull, I keep a, a ruler right next to it. Oh. So this, I uh, photograph the, the frontal, the anterior shot, with the ruler at the face, um, the same uh, place the face is in relation to the camera. So at the face level, I guess you would say, the face... Uh, location. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just as far from the camera as the face is, right next to the face. And on the profile, it's center of the head right here. So it's at about the nose line if you're looking down from up above. So the ruler is in the photograph. So it's exactly the right size. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I have both my eyeballs in there and they're correct on there. I'm going to get rid of those guides. And those are ready for me to start. And I can turn those on and off if I want to, actually. I may as well group those now into a little group and call that eyes and have that done. So I'm ready to start drawing this dude. So grab a pencil and zoom in. Now, what uh, can be handy, you know, artists use uh, reference images. And you can bring those in and use those as well on the side. Looking at this skull specifically, what I see to start with on the eyes is this left eye on the right side of the screen. You notice the top of the orbital cavity is drooping down more, has more of a droop to this side than it does on this side. To me, that means that he's got one of those eyelids that kind of droops over a little bit. You'll also notice that he has a pretty strong brow ridge. You can see it from this profile view pretty well. That's a male trait. I didn't mention the difference between male and female skulls. A male trait has more of a brow ridge and a sloping skull 
than a female. A female has more of an upright skull. And so I'm going to be shadowing in here because this, as you see, tips away from the light. It's a real strong brow ridge, so I'll be looking at that. Oh, I didn't um, do where he attaches there, did I? Let me show you that part too. So let me get back to my ruler before I start drawing. I need to show where he attaches there and turn that. Why didn't that turn? Rotate. There we go. Okay. So we need to attach his uh, malar tubercles, show where the eyelid attaches on the outside of the eye. So if you can't see those malar tubercles, those little uh, bumps on here where your eyelid attaches, those are indicated by the suture on the outside of the eye. Uh, if the malar tubercles aren't visible, you can draw where the eyelid attaches at about 8 to 10 millimeters below the suture there. So I'll put his in about here for this eye, 8 to 10, about there. And then let's drag it over to the other eye and do it over here as well. The suture is here. Is that where the suture is? Let me take a look. Yeah, the suture is kind of low on this side, and 8 to 10 is about here on him. Okay, so now we're ready to draw him here. Notice it's higher on this side and lower on that side. My eyes do that too. Uh, everybody's not symmetrical. Your face is not symmetrical. Get over it. This is happening on his nose as well. Um, my nostrils are not symmetrical. <laughs> one of them points forward and one of them points at an angle. I mean, nobody's exactly perfect. So you're going to see that. That's what makes the face um, recognizable to somebody is that there's subtle little differences on the face. And so that's what you're trying to look for that makes this skull different from every other skull. But that's that's what we're going to see. The inside of the eye uh, attaches right here. You'll see that there's this sort of this groove, this little trench. That's a fossa, the Latin term fossa means groove or trench. That's a lacrimal fossa where your tear ducts are, where the tears come out. So the inside of the eye attaches about halfway down the lacrimal fossa, and it's normally lower than the outside attachment um, to promote tear drainage. So it's going to attach probably down in here. And on this side, about halfway down, probably down in here, maybe a little bit lower because this one is so low. I'll attach it down in here. But in any case, um, you can, like I said, it, it can be helpful for artists to bring in a reference image. And I did put some aside just to have something there. Brought in this dude because he's got... He's got these eyes that have this little fold over it, and that's kind of what I was thinking was happening here because of this, notice this sort of drift that he's got on this eye. So I'm going to kind of keep this over to the side while I'm drawing to give me a kind of an idea of what I, what I have. But in any case, I'm going to start with this eye and begin. Remember again that the eye is the ball. There's a ball to this eye, so this is where you're going to have the, the little pink edge of the eye where the this inside part here, and then the eye comes up here, and then this, we're going to have it kind of come down that way, and it's going to attach out here, something Murphy like that. is wondering if you could tell a skull was a Neanderthal just from the size of the eyes. Not me. Remember, I'm, a, I'm not an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. I'm an artist. <laughs> I'm not trained in bone stuff. I, I have worked with skulls for a while and and I I did have a case recently where I was told that the skull was a young white male and when I looked at it I I was convinced that it was an older black male and so I, I pointed it out to my forensic anthropologist and and they redid the case that it had been misidentified many years before um, but that is definitely not my training I mean I could probably tell that it was not uh, a human skull from um, anything um, current. I could tell that it that it were that it was a, a, an older skull, one that is not. The features of the skull are not are not uh, anything that that are seen in man now. But I I would not, you know, I I certainly can't say that I'm someone that can identify bones. That's not my training. All right, thank you. And I don't want to pretend that it is. <laughs> Definitely not. I'm just the artist, man, that's all. 
So I'm just going to come in and draw some basic eyes. And, and this, again, is just for um, just for me to have as a reference later on when I start drawing and to make sure I'm keeping things in the right place. I'm not drawing this uh, in great detail. Just to have it here uh, for later on when I'm doing the work to um, make sure I'm keeping things where they need to be. And I'll turn it on and off. That's why I've got it in red so I can see it underneath my drawing later. Now the eyebrows with men are usually thicker and heavier and they're going to follow the line of the orbital cavity, the top of the orbital cavity. Usually when they hit the outside of the pupil is when you start to get the eyebrows that go that way. They come down. But until then, they all go up. Now this guy has this eyebrow and since they, they come, he's got this heavy brow ridge here. I'm going to bring him down a little bit. They come down. But then his come up. And then he starts coming down like that. And then he's got these that come down low. So he's got a bit of that. So then I might turn this on and see how that's going. Maybe turn the eyeballs off a little bit. And this is kind of, that's looking a little bit low. So maybe I'll bring that down a bit. Not as high. A little bit lower. Somewhere in there. Okay and continue. Okay, so I'm working on that. And then I notice here also, let me draw in a little bit of shadow for there because this is, you can see the shadow, the shape of the bone, the brow ridge going through here. You can see when you're coming down through here that this side has more of a curve and this side comes down flatter. Do you see how that sweeps out that way and this one just kind of comes down that way? You can see that, sure you can. And then this is going to be shaded through here, of course, because that comes through. This this is a cavity that it goes in. The, the eyeball is inside this cavity in here, so you're going to have shading in there. But then we come to the nose. Now we'll need the ruler for this as well. And we're going to have to turn that again. This ruler gets a, a lot of rotating through the day. Okay, now with a European nose, the nostrils are normally five millimeters wide outside the widest portion of the nasal opening. So this guy's nasal opening widest portion on the right side is about here. So if we go five millimeters past is about there. And then on this side, widest portion is about there. And so go out five is about there. Now the top of the nostril will be an indicated, you could just see a slight indication here. Do you see where these little edges are right in there? That's where it's gonna go. You notice that the bottom is not straight. Look how it goes that way. It comes slightly up on the left hand side. So it's gonna, it's gonna drop down maybe about five millimeters underneath, but it's going to be at an angle. So these nostrils are not gonna be even. They're gonna come down like this, and one is going to drop lower than the other. And there, here's the center line of the nose right there. So he's going to be something like this. Okay, and then you'll see the mouth has a pretty wide area between the two front teeth there. So he's going to have a pretty wide filtrum through the bottom there, and then come up there. Okay, and we'll work on the nostrils as we get done. When you get to the mouth, the mouth normally in repose as it's sitting there not smiling is six teeth wide. And it's nice, this guy has a full set of teeth. A lot of times the skulls that you work with do not. Um, but consider that the mouth is barrel shaped, it comes around. And so when you're going six teeth wide, you have to consider that it's going around the skull. So it's not just straight six teeth. Uh, the lip line is about a third of the way up the top tooth. So if you consider six teeth wide, but then go around a bit and maybe around there somewhere. So three teeth out and a little bit more. So three teeth that way would make six teeth and a little bit more. Somewhere around there is where his mouth is gonna be. I've got a question from Denise and she's wondering, is there a point um, you know, in time when a skull becomes non-reconstructible? Well, if it becomes uh, 
if it falls apart from age, I haven't had anything like that myself. I've had skulls that have been damaged by fire, but if the forensic an anthropologist can rebuild it, then I can certainly work on that. That can be used. Um, I, you know, I've seen, well, we've all seen historical cases uh, where they've rebuilt skulls from Egypt that have been mummified, you know, that have been preserved through mummified remains or the cases of uh, the bog remains that have been found in bogs that have been preserved really well. So as long as you have the bone that is still in good condition, then sure you can work on it. That would be great. Are okay. you using a particular layout in Painter right now, or did you create your own? I am not, actually. What I have, let me, yeah, I forgot to mention that, didn't I? I have, uh, this is about 3,100 by 1,650. So it's really just, I started out with um, 300 resolution and then just threw the, the pictures in. I thought it was um, 10 by 18, but somehow it changes. I don't know how it changes, but it changed it. So now it's 5 by 10 but it's 300 resolutions so that I can zoom in and out and see the skulls at, at a really good um, resolution when I zoom in so that they're clear when I come in and, and go out. Okay, so the, uh, the mouth is just as high as the enamel on the teeth. And notice this guy has something unusual in that his, his canines on the lower teeth droop down. And that's kind of unusual. I have found uh, some, I did save a photo of some lips that do that. So it's not unheard of. You know, it's just guys do that there. They look a little goofy, but you know, they do. People do. It happens. Okay, so that's where you're going to put the mouth on this face. And then the outside of the face is basically going to follow the tissue depth markers out here. This one swoops in a little bit. I'm not going to swoop it in. That, that would look weird. But there it is on the sides and come down on the sides. I mean, if you wanted to have hollowed out cheeks, that's okay, I guess. This, uh, if you bring in the guide, you'll see that it is a little bit crooked. This is a little bit higher on this side. So I'll bring it up a little bit here and down a little bit there. He's got a square chin. And then bring this down and that down. And come down here. And there, and that's basically the outline of his face. So if we zoom out and turn off the guides and take a look, that's kind of what we're working with to start with. And it looks horrible, of course, but that's just our um, our measurements to begin with. That's kind of what our face is going to look like. You can also see where the shading is going to come in because that's where the tissue depth markers are, right through there. So you're going to get some shading through there. You're going to get shading right through here where this temporal bone comes through. That's going to happen there too. But so there we are. That's what we're going to begin with. So I'm going to start to draw this guy using those measurements just for um, just for guides as we go. So we'll turn the pencil back to black. We'll come through and begin. I'm using a pencil right now that uh, that isn't in the regular uh, pens and pencils box. This is one that one of the guys on the Corel Beta team, Corel Beta team, uh, gave us. And so I've been messing around with this, and I, I I really like it. Thanks to Hector. So I'll come in and start. I've got a new layer. Let me name that so I don't get mixed up. Because with all the layers, that does happen. I'll just call that the sketch layer. Are you using any kind of tablet right now? Yes, yes, I am. I have the uh, Cintiq 22. Okay. It makes a big difference. My first Cintiq was the 12 inch, and they don't even make that anymore. But at the time, it was really cool. Well, actually, I think I did have the, um, I did have an Intuos, but I, I never could get into that. I, I just was not able to um, get the hand eye coordination right. It just didn't feel right for me. So then I got the 12 inch Cintiq and that was pretty amazing. How long does a typical reconstruction take you? Well, I can usually get one of these done in about the eight hours, uh, but then I like to uh, take, where are my eyes? There they are. Then I like to take uh, 
the night and not think about it, not look at it, and come back the next day and look at it again and work on it some more. So maybe about 12 hours. Okay. You need to have a break from it and get away and, and come back and look at it again. I also have a couple of um, forensic art colleagues that I do consult with or, or if I have some questions or some issues about a case, if I am unsure about something, the way something is looking or working, I might uh, send it to them and see if they have any input on it too. There's sometimes weird things come up with skulls and strange things that you're not sure how they might look when they actually come out. Thank you. Yeah. So just doing a little bit of work on this dude. Let me turn the measurement layer off. And I have to warn you that the first look at this comes through and looks pretty bad. And I like to do a lot of blending. So I grab my blend tool. I was really sad when Painter took away the regular blur and uh, Used to have blur and diffuse blur, and now there's just diffuse blur. And I have to learn to make my own brushes to use the regular blur. I know you can switch back to the old brushes, but it's kind of a time thing. It takes a little time to do that, <laughs> to switch back and forth between the old brush library and the new ones. So now I just make do with diffuse blur. And it does it makes a difference to which direction you blur in and how big the brush is. You could export the brush that you like and then import it into 2019. Ah, there you go. That would work. It's good to know these things. Okay, thanks. Okay, so give this guy a little bit of shading. Remember that uh, the eye is a ball. It's going to get darker as it goes around and it's going to have some shadow from the upper lid on the top, especially as this lid is a bit of an overhanging lid. So get some of that going in there. And to make it look better so I don't feel bad, we'll put a little highlight in on him and cheer him up. Okay, so come through and look at that. That's where he fits. See where the shading goes because you can see the bone. So you know where it's going to get shaded. And then how this comes down through here, this portion of the face. I mean, that's, how cool is that, right? You can see where it's going to go. How can you not love that? I love that, man. Okay, let's take a look at how that's going. Do a little bit more of the blur. I really just blur that out so you can hardly see it, don't I? Sometimes after I uh, work on this, I just duplicate the layer so that I can see, because <laughs> I've blurred so much that you could barely see it. I draw light all the time. That's why working digital works really well for me. When I would draw uh, composites at the police department, a lot of times I would draw very light and my shading would just about disappear when they would scan the drawing. Uh, but digitally, it comes up so much better. Um, you don't have to scan it uh, and all the drawing that you do reproduces exactly the way you drew it. And so what you see is really what you get where that's not necessarily the case um, for drawing with pencil. Okay, so there's one eye, one eye for this dude. Okay, let's go back to the other eye and start putting him in. And as you recall, this one is a little bit higher on this side. He attaches higher on the outside there. And again, going around, where's my eye? Going around this ball and coming down here. And the upper eyelid goes over the lower eyelid. They don't come together. The upper eyelid overlaps the lower eyelid. But try and, try and think of it as you're drawing it, try and think of it as being a ball. And that it's going back deeper into this, this cavity, this orbital cavity in the head. So think of how you would draw that. Okay, dump that. And let's dump that too.
Let's see, that's a cavity. It's dark in there. Draw some shadows. It's dark in here. And then this is really dark. Because as you see over here, it's dipping in away from the light. So let's get that in there and through there. I forgot to mention at the very beginning that we are recording this just so that everybody knows. Um, you can watch it back again later today once it processes. And a question for you, Natalie, I, I know that you have your, um, your book on Amazon. I do. And yes, I did. Um, I did write a book earlier this year. I had uh, done workshops in the past teaching other cops and forensic artists how to draw digitally because it's not really that common in the field yet. It's a it's really a small field of forensic artists. There's not that many of them out there. Um, as I said in the Corel interview, there's only about 50 of them full time in the country. There's uh, quite a few part time, but not that many full time forensic artists really in the U.S. And uh, a lot of them are cops who were, as I was, um, approached by a sergeant and said, hey, we're putting on this training. Do you want to go? Or, hey, we're putting on this training. You have to go. Um, you may not have any art background, but we need a guy to do this in the department and we chose you. And so it's uh, maybe a cop that isn't really comfortable drawing and he's not, uh, he doesn't really have a network of other artists to work with. And so he isn't really familiar with the, what's happening in the forensic art world. And so if he doesn't have a lot of contact with it and he doesn't know a lot about what's going on, he may not be that familiar with the tools that are available right now. So I, uh, I wrote this book for someone who may want to learn about it and hasn't had access to the training because it's, up till now there hasn't, there hasn't really been anybody else doing any training on uh, digital forensic art besides me, as far as I know. Uh, and so there's only so much that I can do and I haven't, <laughs> I haven't been doing uh, any training in it recently. It, it really is a pain in the neck. Um, the <laughs> Wacom was very generous and supplied the training tablets to me for my classes, but no matter how much prep I would do the day before, the students on Monday, everybody's tablets would break. I don't know how, what, what they would do. There was something that would happen and, and all through the day I would have to go and, and reset their tablets one by one and interrupt the class one by one. So it really got to be a really difficult thing to put on uh, solo. So I kind of stopped training, but I uh, put out the book to give people still that, that uh, learning resource. And so that's out there now available on Amazon. Um, if anybody wants to learn how I do it, of course, everybody can do it the way they want to do it, but this is just to show um, how I do composites and then also these uh, reconstructions. And I also talk about uh, postmortem drawings, which are also drawings of unidentified remains, but um, those are fleshed remains. Um, people that still have flesh, uh, but are more decomposed. So I do those too. There are all kinds of questions <laughs> coming in now. Um, I just wanted to let you know I posted or I copied the link to your book in oh, the questions panel. And as Natalie mentioned, we also have an artist interview with her. So you can go to painterartist.com and we link to the book from there as well. And you can find out much more about her background. Very interesting. Um, so let me try and parse through these questions here. How do you determine eye and hair color? A lot of times I do not. Most of the skulls, and it, it could be because I work, again, um, very closely with the King County Medical Examiner's Office up in Seattle, and just the um, the area that I work in up there, or the, the cases that I get up there are in um, the wet Pacific Northwest, and a lot of uh, a lot of stuff rots quickly. I don't get hair and clothing. A lot of that is just gone by the time the remains are found, and so determining hair color is a guess for me. Um, notice 
as I'm talking about this, I was following the upper edge of the orbital cavity for the eyebrows, and let me take a look at where I've got things. Okay, that's where it needs to be. Okay, continuing. So eye, uh, hair color is mostly a guess. Um, occasionally, with some cases, you will find some hairs here and there. I did find uh, in one set of remains there were some hairs that were uh, tiny, tiny little dark mustache hairs that were stuck in, and I kind of hesitate to say it if you're easily grossed out, in the decompositional fluid that was uh, dried up on the bone. But that enabled me to know that this guy had dark hair. So that was a lucky thing. Um, some people do find in other uh, climates, do get to find a, a hair mass. Sometimes the hair will, will dry up in a more dry climate and, and just kind of form just like a, a, like a wig or a skull cap of hair uh, that can be found close by the body. Uh, or small animals or birds will, will take some of the hair and, and use it for nesting material in the, the People at the scene, the forensic anthropologists will find it at the scene and notify the forensic artist at that time so they can find that. But I don't normally have it. Reference eye color? No, you can, you're not going to know it at all. That's just a guess. So you try and use something sort of in the middle, not too light, not too dark. Um, let me dump that. Uh, that can be read either way. A lot of what we do is what is called the intentional ambiguity so that I can do something that can be read as either light or dark on purpose or maybe that can be read as either wavy or straight, if I'm talking about hair. Maybe do it a little bit wavy on one side, a little bit straight on the other, and we've had artists that do that. I'm starting on the nose now, as you see. So we do things uh, so that it can hopefully get the, the best chance of being identified. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Try not to make too much of a statement in one way or another. Jesse is wondering how somebody that's not a police officer can become involved in art like this. I knew that question would come up, Jesse. We get that a lot in um, in workshops and classes. Uh, it's incredibly difficult. Um, consider that law enforcement has to be able to know you and trust you. If you have a, a murder case um, where you have a homicide and you have a uh, body, you finally get the body identified, and eventually the detective uh, is trying to get this suspect behind bars on this case, and um, they need to be able to trust the artist to do a good job with the victim and not screw up this case in any way, not to suggest anything to the victim, not to make any errors that might in any way impact the case that might give the defense attorney any out in getting this suspect off on on any sort of appeals or, or no way to get to to endanger the case at all. The the police department is not going to trust anyone who is not in law enforcement, basically. Um, it's very difficult to get in. We have had uh, most of the training is open only to law enforcement. There are some training classes that are open to civilians because it's excellent training for people who want to learn to draw faces. It's really good. And so um, Scottsdale Artist School has training for that in uh, in Phoenix, Scottsdale area in Arizona. Uh, and there's some really good instructors there who teach. Um, but We've had so many students come through. I, I taught there myself for a little bit. We have had so many students come through that are dying to get into the field and that find it really difficult to do so, to find a police department that will give them that first case. And it's incredibly hard for them. Um, they may eventually find a small department to take them on. Sometimes they can get a civilian position within the department and build up the trust that way, or they can uh, find a forensic artist that works at a department that will take them on as an intern or some other position, but it's not easy to get into. And you can understand why, because it's not like any other art position, you know, something that, that is involved in, in, in legal work and it, and it has consequences. Okay, so there's the nose. Kind of just blocked in, but there it is. Can you would repeat why you chose to make the left eye um, a drooping eyelid and the right eye not? Yeah, take a look at the top of the orbital cavities. Let me show the guidelines here and move it up. 
can you see along the top of this orbital cavity, this one is more straight, this one comes down at an angle. That mm -hmm. to me means we've got a, a bit of a droop happening over here. We've got something different on this, this eyelid than is happening on this eyelid. This one is more straight across, that one comes down. This one attaches further up, that one attaches further down. The, um, the suture where the bones meet here is higher, this suture is lower on the head. So this one's gonna come down lower. So okay. to me, that, that's coming down at an angle. Yeah. How do you determine where you draw hairlines? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, there's, uh, there's three different schools of thought, really, in the, in the world. Hmm. Sorry, time to sip water. Uh, for forensic art, really, or three different places where, where it was studied. There's the U.S., there's uh, Manchester, and well, England, and there's Russia. And uh, they've all kind of developed their own ways of doing things. And in Manchester, a really intelligent woman, Carolyn Wilkinson, has written a couple books about it. And she said, you can feel the hairline on skulls. In the U.S., we haven't studied that. I don't know if they studied it in Russia. Russia's done a lot of studies on noses. But in Manchester, Dr. Wilkinson said you can put a little bit of, um, I think it's linseed oil, maybe, or was it distilled water on your finger, and you can actually feel the hairline on the skull. I, I don't know anybody in the U.S. that has tried that. Um, my anthropologist said that's not possible because the hair doesn't touch the skull. But I don't know. I don't know. They do it in Manchester, presumably, and, and it works there. But I myself do not know. For me, it's kind of a guess going on what you see on the skull, what it feels like when you're working on it, and you kind of get a feel for how things are. Um, when you're, you're touching the skull, you're touching somebody's cranium, you're touching their bones, and as you're working on the case, you kind of get a feel for what this person looks like or, or how the person feels. Yeah, it's a personal thing. I don't know. Can you tell the victim's age from the skull structure? The forensic anthropologist can. Um, I can. I can say that I've I've worked with many skulls over the years, and I can see what skull is old and what skull is is young. But I I certainly have not received that training. That is not my area of expertise. But I can uh, I can tell if if something's really old. It's the the sutures on the skull, where the bones come together, like through here, all these lines through here, as you get older, those start to knit together, and they're not as clear and defined. So that's one, one thing, in any case. That's the easiest method to tell. But also, you know, they start looking older and, and more decrepit. Um, and then you have uh, loss of teeth, so loss of bone through the, the mandible here because of the tooth loss. Yeah, you can see, you can tell. Okay. Can you, um, <laughs> there's so many questions coming in, and we're getting to the top of the hour. I told you that Are we really we would never have an issue with ending early. Okay. Um, All right. Well, I can show you the drawing that I came up with earlier. So there. Um, okay. Um, how do you draw the ears? Do you guess that Dude. as well? Yes, you do. Ears are, are cartilage, so there's not going to be any indication to the ears afterwards. Although, <laughs> I just love this thing about this. This is something Russians that um, studied that I have yet to see studied in the U.S. This little sucker here, this is, um, this is an indication that the Russians have studied in regards to the ears. It's called the mastoid process. They, they have a theory that the direction that this mastoid process is pointing will indicate whether you have free hanging earlobes or not, whether your earlobes are attached or not. And they say whether this mastoid process points forward or whether it's a downward directed mastoid process indicates whether your ears are attached, your lobes are attached. Which I think is fascinating, but that's just me. So I keep looking at all the different uh, cases that I have and seeing if the mastoid process are attached and then uh, find out later on. Okay, since I'm out of time already, well, let me come up with, show you the uh, drawing that I did in the past. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so here's your skull. So this is the drawing that I came up with beforehand. Let me bring him up. Okay, 
there's the skull, here's some pencil tone to it. As you see, I have the profile on the side and it came up with, again, hair is just a guess, ears were just a guess. Um, that is one method of drawing tone was just by doing it with pencil there. Uh, there's another method that I use where I can bring in a photograph and draw some tone using, or add some tone using a photograph that way. Um, here's my other sketch on top of that. Yeah, it's pretty much basically the same. It's in the same place anyway. Uh, so that's how that is. I can also do uh, tone in color. I don't, I don't like to use color as much. That's, that's a little bit more um, disputed in the forensic art world. People have questions about whether color is, is uh, more subjective. I, you know, I don't know if that's really that big a deal, but I, I tend to prefer black and white. And right here I've used the, uh, the hair in, um, I've done the hair in black and white as well. So we can dump that down, but try to, try to do the hair normally in a, uh, in a lighter tone um, that can be read either light or dark either way. So do it that way. So interesting, Natalie. You should see all the, the comments here. Everybody is finding this totally fascinating. Really? And I know we can't get to all of the questions. Some of them I know would require some really in-depth answers. Um, so yeah. One more that, so are these types of illustrations admissible in court? This is not considered evidence. This is not of evidentiary value, so no. This is considered a tool to help the detectives. Uh, a drawing like this is put out in the media in order for the detective to get some leads on a case. It's usually a cold case. For instance, this one here is one that I just got um, a possible ID on. This is a drawing that I did, and I used color, oops, um, just last month, and they got a possible ID on this guy. If you think it's this fellow here, these are both the pictures of the same guy. Um, and actually got pretty darn close with this guy, although I think I should have changed the eyebrows on him. But look at the, the nose and the mouth and the chin are pretty darn close and the proportions are all exactly right on. So I think it really could be him. But um, it's just, it's a tool that the detective will get contact from people saying, hey, you know, I think it might be somebody that I know. It could be, in one case, I had a, my sister who went missing 40 years ago and it turned out to be her. I mean, it's, it's not something that you take to court and it says this is absolutely this guy, and certainly not in the case of a, uh, a composite where you're drawing the uh, suspect from a witness's description. That is not of evidentiary value at all. Nobody can be arrested on the basis of a composite. It is only a tool for the detectives to use, but it's just something to, to help them out in a case. Forensic art is art that's used for law enforcement purposes or legal purposes. All right. Well, with that, um, to everybody on the line, thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry if we didn't get to answer your question in as much depth as you might have liked, but I think we did get to address 98% of them. So oh, um, I'm sorry I didn't get the whole drawing done. <laughs> it went a lot quicker when I was on my own, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I, that's why yeah. I had the, the drawing on the sidelines in case I didn't get that far, the pre-drawn one. Good well, thing. that's perfectly fine. That's what I expect in these sessions. And a lot of value comes out of being able to answer the questions. And they loved seeing you start from scratch and got Good. a ton out of it. So Excellent. it was wonderful. Thank okay. you so much, Natalie. And I thank everyone for showing up and uh, and coming here for this webinar. I know it's a pretty unusual topic for Corel, but uh, thanks for coming in and that's involved. what made it so fantastic. It's a brand new topic that nobody has seen, and it, it was really wonderful. So great. thanks again, Natalie. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.